can be a difference between telling the truth and being truthful. We know all about being economical with the truth. And we have very good justification for it. We don't want to hurt another person's feelings by being brutally honest with them. And so we hold back. We say what they would like us to say. We dissemble a little. And we do so out of good motives, we say. But in reality, we are much better at holding back on the truth to save ourselves trouble so that we do not become embarrassed so that we do not have to actually say what we really believe. And we think that we are being wise. And it may be that we are. But very often, we are simply trying to save ourselves some trouble. In this passage, our Lord Jesus says some very harsh things to the people who are there. In verse 31, then said Jesus to those Jews which believe on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou we shall be free? And Jesus says to them in verse 37, I know that ye are Abraham's seed, but ye seek to kill me, because my word hath no place in you. That is a moot point as to whether the people being addressed in verse 37, indeed from verse 33, are exactly the same as those who speak in, uh, or who believe in him in verse 31. But there was certainly a mixed gathering, and people were hearing things that were shocking and upsetting. And we are hearing things that are shocking and upsetting all the time today. And of course, everybody thinks that they shouldn't be offended. And therefore, if anyone says anything they don't like, they'll call a policeman and try and have the speaker arrested. But our Lord Jesus spoke the truth plainly, clearly, fully, and without compromise. And it is this, above all things, that shows him to be the perfect redeemer. Satan is a liar and can only speak lies. Abraham never deliberately lied to his descendants, but neither did the word of God come to him to declare to them. It did to Moses and to the prophets, but not to Abraham, whose children these all claim to be. Our Lord Jesus Christ received from the Father the word that he had seen with the Father and in the Father and had from the Father and declared it truly and fully to his hearers during his lifetime. And it is recorded for us in Scripture, and we hear it ourselves. And it is one of the things that we should recognize in the Word of God, that it has the full authority that it had when first it was spoken. And we may quibble about translations and difficulty of language and so on and so forth, but if we do not recognize that Scripture is truly and fully the Word of God, then what is it? And where is the Word of God? There are two things in particular I want to say to you from what is written in verse 46. Which of you convinceth me of sin? Which of you can convict me of any wrongdoing? Now this applies generally to the whole life of the Lord Jesus Christ in that he never sinned. He is the perfect redeemer. But it applies specifically within the context to all those things that he is saying to his hearers in this chapter. That not one of the things he says can be exposed as false, it cannot be undermined, or they may not like it, they may wish to object to it, but they cannot find a single thing to say against it. There's we hear from time to time hack. in the news Anyone of people saying, oh, vision. so-and-so, so a famous character, is a, good. and then you, you know fill in whatever blank you like about your... what you think of them, transphobic, racist, whatever it might be. And if you say to the, the, the accuser, well, give us an example. I can't, but I'm sure it's true. I've never actually heard them say anything, but I don't like their attitude. And there would have been plenty in our Lord's Day who would have said exactly the same thing. Do we like the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do we hear him gladly in all that he says? Is his word important to us? 
It is, necessity, it is a necessity that we have faith in Jesus Christ, who is the speaker of divine truth. Notice what he says in the first half of verse 32. Ye shall know the truth. It matters that we know the truth. Truth is not a subjective thing, as we are told today. Truth is objective. It is factual. There is truth and there is error. One of the weaknesses of so much preaching today is that preachers are not prepared to state, this is truth. Thus saith the Lord, or even thus says the Lord. People aren't prepared to state plainly and clearly what God says. You can get conference speakers who will discourse knowledgeably about the things of the past. Ask them to uh, apply the lessons to today, and they won't. And the reason they won't is they do not wish to be pinned down on their own particular position. But our Lord Jesus Christ was very willing to be pinned down. And yet none could actually squash him, as it were. They couldn't nail him on anything he said. God moves in a mysterious but he way. Pinned them is by English hymn writer and time William again. Cooper. After that, no man durst ask him any more questions. And what was the thing that he had said? What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? And they weren't able to answer him. How that David can say, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand, until I make mine enemies, uh, thine enemies thy footstool. In other words, David was not being the one addressed, but was addressing one who is greater than him, who is not God, that is not the Father, but the Son. They see, our Lord Jesus Christ speaks truth, and it is necessary that we have faith in him as the speaker of divine truth. We do not have faith in Jesus Christ because we like his miracles, God his kindness to the weak way, and his, wonders, his compassion his on the lost. In the sea and Those things are all true, the... but they are not sufficient in themselves. The it is essential so that we have faith in Jesus Christ as the speaker of truth. He is the now, you a question that arises in the minds of a lot of people, if they think, is how can I recognize truth from error when I hear preaching? The answer is, does the preacher conform in doctrine to the teaching of Christ or not? And there are many, when you analyze what they're saying, who do not. It is important that we have faith in Jesus Christ as the speaker of divine truth. But the second thing to consider under this heading is the necessity of faith in Christ as key to obtaining his benefits. You shall know the, the truth, perfect charging verse 32, table that never frays and will never and let you down. Now, see it for yourself. Free. We come to the truth for a reason. We come to the truth not so that we can be the ones to say, oh, well, of course, I know the truth, and I can therefore out-argue anybody else. I know the truth, and therefore I'm better than anybody else. No, no. We need to know the truth in order that we might obtain the benefits that are associated with that truth. We come to Christ for his saving benefits. And one of the great dangers the church has faced down the millennia is when those who are in authority either do not know or actively deny the true benefits of Christ and then teach something else instead. That was the case in the medieval church. It is the case in the Roman Catholic Church today. But you will find very few who are willing to say so. You can look at the, the cults, as they're known, the Seventh Adventists, the, uh, the Jehovah's Witnesses, and, and so on and so forth. And you can see in them certain good moral characteristics, and people are drawn to them. But do they know the truth? They do not. It is important that if we would have the saving benefits of Christ, we must come to him. What are those saving benefits? Well, in a word, those which he speaks of 
in verses 34, 35, and 36. Jesus answers those who object, saying, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say to you, whosoever committeth sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the Son abideth ever. If the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. Now what is this freedom of which he speaks? Well, it is the difference between sonship and servanthood. Think of the parable of the prodigal son. There was one who went off and became a servant through his folly and sin, and returned expecting to be a servant and was free. And there was the son who remained in the house and acted like a servant. That was his error. He didn't recognize the liberty that was his, and he lived as if he was a servant. Now, it is important that we recognize the difference between servanthood and sonship. Are we the servants of sin, or are we the sons of God? Are we the lovers and doers of iniquity, or are we the lovers and doers of righteousness? Have we been brought into the liberty of the sons of God? And if anybody is thinking, well, this is all rather sexist language to talk about sons of God, it is worth pointing out that under the Old Testament settlement, with one exception, it was sons who inherit and not daughters. And therefore, it naturally follows, follows that when you're talking about inheritance, you're talking about sonship. But of course, to be the son is also to be the heir. And to be the heir is to be the inheritor of everything that the father has to give. And I'm not going to go on into detail about what those blessings are. I suggest you probably know them. And if you don't, you're going to hear something about them today. But unless we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ as the speaker of the truth, we will not believe that he is the one who gives to us the benefits of his saving work. We will view him as perhaps an example to be followed in some things. But ultimately, we will not have him to be the saviour. And that is one of the great weaknesses of so much modern evangelicalism, is a degree of doubt about the uniqueness of Jesus Christ. Perfect redemption requires a perfect redeemer. A perfect redeemer is one who speaks the truth fully and clearly, and who also grants what he promises. I shall bring the matter to a conclusion here. We were going to sing a hymn, but I think we are at the... Oh, we have. I'll give you a moment to... Uh, <laughs> thank you. To, uh, to get ready. But um, if you would turn then in your hymn sheets um, to the first hymn. Glory be to God the Father. Glory be to God the Son. Glory be to God the Spirit. Great Jehovah, three in one. Glory, 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 while eternal ages run. Don't forget to repeat the glory, glory.
seated. <clears throat> well, now it is a great pleasure to welcome our first speaker, Pastor Harry Dowds, all the way from Northern Ireland. Um, ah, yes, thank you. <laughs> Sorry. I can see my notes with my glasses on. You are all a blur. Um, but I, I should have brought my other glasses, in which case most things would have been a blur, but not as bad. Um, Harry is coming to speak on the message of hope in the life of Joseph. Uh, I have uh, had the benefit of hearing one of your sermons online, and uh, on the basis of that vast experience, um, look forward to hearing what you have to say to us this morning. Uh, those of you who are members of the congregation here will, of course, need no further introduction, but just in case you don't, uh, Pastor Dowds is the father of Pastor Dowds. So there we are. Um, good to have family connections. Uh, in case you're wondering, my father was also a clergyman, as was his father before him and his father before him. So the family line continues. So thank you very much. Well, thank you very much. Thank you for the welcome here. It is good to be able to join with you to come to share the Word of God. It always is an immense privilege to be able to bring the Scriptures and to open the Book of God and to share it with, with folk. What a blessing it is to have the Lord at work in your life and giving you that great, great honour. And uh, I'm a pastor, as you've heard, and from Stone Park Baptist Church. And you might say, well, where is that? Well, it's in Northern Ireland. And out to the west, if you haven't heard of Fermanagh, many people will have heard of Enniskillen. And we are about 14 miles outside of Enniskillen. And I was saying to somebody earlier on that um, where we live and where our church is located, it's right out in the country. Uh, we live just around the corner from the church building. The road we live on is just over a mile long and there's nine houses on it. And we see more cows and sheep and foxes and deers and squirrels than we do people sometimes. <laughs> so this is like a different world for us here. But I'm delighted to be able to come and share the Word of God with you. Um, I will say this just now. Whenever I was asked to come to preach today, I was told there would be another preacher. But it was some time later that informed me that it was Jeff Thomas. And I began to feel weak in the knees as soon as I heard that. And in my mind, it came that I felt like an amateur league footballer being asked to play alongside Messi. But maybe the Lord has been merciful and delayed the trains and Jeff isn't here yet. <laughs> and, and I'll get finished before he arrives. <laughs> but well, you've heard the title that I've been given. And it is the message of hope in the life of Joseph. So just to focus our thoughts, we're going to turn to Genesis 50. Genesis chapter 50. And we'll commence at the first verse to get the flow of thought and get the connection as we read in uh, Genesis chapter 50. And so we read from the first verse, reminding ourselves that this is the word of the living God. And we read here, And Joseph fell upon his father's face, and went upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his servants, the physicians, to embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel, and forty days were fulfilled for him. For so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. When the days of his mourning were past, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, if now I have found grace in your eyes, speak, I pray you, in the, ear, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear, saying, Lo, I die. In my grave, which I have digged for me in the land of Canaan, there shall thou bury me. Now therefore let me go, I pray thee, and bury my father, and I will come again. And Pharaoh said, Go up and bury thy father, according as he made thee swear. And Joseph went up to bury his father. And with him went up all the servants of Pharaoh, the elders of his house, and all the elders of the land of Egypt, and all the house of Joseph and his brethren and his father's house, only their little ones and their flocks and their herds they left in the land of Goshen. 
They went up with him, both chariots and horsemen, and it was a very great company. They came to the threshing floor of Atad, which is beyond Jordan, and there they mourned with a great and very sore lamentation. And he made a mourning for his father seven days. When the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites, saw the mourning in the land of Atad, they said, This is grievous mourning to the Egyptians. Wherefore the name of it was called Abel Mizraim, which is beyond Jordan. And his sons did unto him according as he commanded them. For his sons carried him into the land of Canaan and buried him in the cave of the field of Machpelah, which Abram bought with the field for a possession of a burying place of Ephron the Hittite before Mamre. And Joseph returned into Egypt, he and his brethren, and all who went up with him to bury his father after he, uh, with him to bury his father after he had buried his father. And when Joseph's brethren saw that their father was dead, they said, Joseph will peradventure hate us, and will certainly require, requite us all the evil which we did unto him. And they sent a messenger unto Joseph, saying, Thy father did command before he died, saying, So shall you say unto Joseph, Forgive, I pray thee now, the trespass of thy brethren and their sin, for they did unto thee evil. And now we pray thee, forgive the trespass of the servants of the God of thy father. And Joseph wept when they spake unto him. And his brethren also went and fell down before his face, and, and they said, Behold, we be thy servants. And Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for a man the place of God. But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. Now therefore fear, fear ye not, I will nourish you and your little ones. And he comforted them. And speak kindly unto them. This is the word of God. Now this morning, I'm not going to concentrate just on one verse or one passage and expound it. But given the title um, uh, that is given to me, the message of hope in the life of Joseph, what we're going, what we're going to do is be like drones as it were. And we're going to rise up and sort of view the landscape of Joseph's life from a height and try to take it all in. But then come and zoom down more narrowly and certain specific aspects and events of this. And we will see this glorious message of hope as it is portrayed for us in the life of Joseph. And as we do so, I'm going to group what I have to say just under four words. And the first word is this the word purpose. Purpose. One of the tragedies of the current age in which we live is that so many people live their lives without any sense of purpose. And this is one of the, trage the tragedies of uh, accepting the, the evolutionary theories because atheistic evolution and I think theistic evolution is a bit of a contradiction in terms, but there we are. But uh, the evolutionary hypothesis, it robs people of any sense of hope, of meaning. They have come here by some sort of random chance, and they live through this life just to go out into nothingness at the end of it all, and there's no purpose whatsoever to be found in this life. But the wonderful thing is that Joseph knew that there was purpose in his life. And he speaks about this purpose and the nature of this purpose, that it was a good purpose. Because he says to his brothers, verse 20, for what we read, but as for you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. And there was this wonderful purpose in Joseph's life, and it was a good purpose. Because it was from the hand of God, it wasn't only good, but it was a wise purpose. The wonderful that we have a God to serve and to whom we yield our all, a God who will never, ever have to apologize to us for anything. He will never have to say, sorry, I was mistaken in that. He is always right. He is always wise. And he is always good. And this good purpose. Of course, we delight in what we read in Romans, don't we? 
What we read there, for all things work together for good to them who love God. They're called according to his purpose. And it tells us as it goes on what that good purpose is. Because those who have been predestined, well, they've been predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And as we sit here this morning, if we have been brought to that wonderful redemption in Christ, there is a purpose that we have in our lives that is being worked out every moment of our lives. And that is to conform us to the glorious image of Christ, make us more and more like him. And the day will come, as it tells us in First John, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is, and it will be brought to fruition. But in the interim, we are being molded shape with this great purpose in view. Isn't that a wonderful thing to realize? And of course, that will issue in the glory of God and bring glory and honor to him. But the scope of this purpose, this good purpose for Joseph, well, he tells us something about the scope of it here. He says, but as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God met it unto good to bring to pass, that is this, this, this day, to save much people alive. And the purpose in Joseph's life under the hand of God, this good, wise purpose, was to save many people alive. And we can read about the company that he was to save alive there in Genesis 45, 7. And it tells us that there was with Jacob a company of 66 people who came down into Egypt that they might preserve, be preserved in that time of famine. And then there was Joseph, there was four that constituted his family, making up 70. But there they were, and there was this purpose of God, that that people might be kept alive, they might be preserved. But it wasn't just the preservation of those 70. It was something much, much more radical and wonderful than that. Because there would be the fulfillment, the keeping of covenant promises, as this good purpose is being worked out. Because the way back there in Genesis chapter 12, whenever the Lord first brought Abram as he was then out of, out of the Chaldees, and he speaks to Abram clearly and makes promises to him. We read it, Now the Lord God has said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto the land that I will show you, and I will make of thee a great nation. And bless thee and make thy name great. And there is a promise made to Abram. You are going to be made a great, great nation and given a great name. And in you, the nations of the earth will be blessed. And that is reiterated in definite covenantal form in, in Acts chapter 17. Where again the Lord comes and speaks to him and says, I am the almighty God, walk before me, be thy perfect. I will make my covenant between me and thee and will multiply thee exceedingly. And he reiterates this, Abraham, you're going to multiply exceedingly. There's a great nation that is yet to come for you. Now, God took time working out that purpose because Abraham left his life with few children. Isn't that right? And then it took time for the family gradually to to, to develop until even with Jacob there's now those 70 but there is to be a great nation and it was in part of God's wonderful dealings that he brings Joseph down into Egypt that his covenantal promises might be kept and might be fil fulfilled and there in Egypt they will know a degree of protection they will be guarded and they will indeed multiply, 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 and grow. Unless you think that I'm maybe um, reading too much into things whenever it speaks about um, this in the land of Egypt and being the place where they would grow. Whenever you read in the book of Psalms, in Psalm 105, you do find that, uh, again, the idea of the covenant is referred to in this psalm. And he says this in verse 7 of Psalm 105, that the Lord, he is the Lord our God. His judgments are in all the earth. He hath remembered his covenant forever. 
The word which he commanded to a thousand generations, which co- covenant he made with Abraham and his oath unto Isaac. And here he refers to the covenant that was made with Abraham. As he makes his way down through the psalm, within that same context, he speaks about how he sent the man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant. And he speaks of this within that context of the covenant. And he will go on and speak in verse 24 of how eventually they're brought down into Egypt. And he increased his people greatly and made them stronger than their enemies. And here is this great purpose that is worked out, that Joseph will be brought down into that land of Egypt, that then the rest of that family might be brought down, and in that land God will keep his promise, the people will be multiplied, they will become that mighty nation. But you know, it goes beyond that, because who will eventually come through that nation and walk in this earth, but the very Son of God made flesh. And there is that great promise fulfilled. And that was the means by which all nations would be blessed in Abraham, through this one who came of his seed into this world. And as we sit here this morning, we are beneficiaries of this. And we, everyone, should thank God for Joseph, Because if it were not for Joseph, we wouldn't have had Jesus. This is a wonderful, wonderful thing that God did. Taking a young man and making him part of this glorious purpose that he had. And as we sit here, none of us know what purpose God is going to work out. And even use us, dare I say it like this, to bring Jesus to the world. No, no. How wonderful God works. Word number one, purpose. Word number two, providence. Because in the fulfilling of God's activity here, we see a tremendous display of God's marvelous providence. Now, at the time we use words and we take it for granted that people know what the words mean, Maybe we use the words ourselves and we're not fully aware of what they mean. And um, as preachers, we can do that so readily and use terms and think that people understand these things. I remember um, I have a tape of a man called Bob Sheehan. don't know if any of you remember Bob Sheehan, but this tape about reform preaching, and I've listened to it many times. And he mentions this problem about preachers just taking it for granted that people know about things. And so he was preaching through Hebrews in his midweek meetings, and this lady from the nearby town was coming in unsaved. And he'd come to this place about Melchizedek in the book of Hebrews, and he thought, I have to explain this very clearly so that this lady understands. And so he explained this clearly, as lucidly as he could, about Melchizedek. And on the way out, the lady said to him, Mr. Sheehan, that was very interesting this evening, but tell me, who was Abraham? (laughs) <laughs> took for granted she know all about Abraham but didn't. Providence, what is providence? Let me give you a very, n- not a full definition, but a working definition for now. Providence is that activity of God whereby he orders and directs all things for the good of his people and the glory of his name. Now you wonder and think about The magnificence of that. There's a God who orders and directs all things, not some things, all things for the good of his people and the glory of his name. And as God does order and direct all things, it includes what we would call the micro, the things that the world would look upon as being insignificant, virtually meaningless But God does direct even those things. And as we look down in the life of Joseph, we see this brought to our attention so remarkably. Let me list a number of things for you in which we think of this or see this uh, brought to our attention. Number one, you see God's wonderful activity and providence in the giving of a coat. Remember there in Genesis 37, 
where we read about uh, Jacob, Israel, as he called here. And it says in verse 3, Now Israel loved Joseph more than all his children, because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a coat of many colors. And when his brethren saw that their father loved him more than all his brethren, they hated him and could not speak peaceably unto him. And here is this coat, a gift from a father to a young son in his mid-teens. And who could have imagined that such repercussions could have come from the gift of a coat? In Acts chapter 7, as Peter is Steve, uh, Stephen is speaking about Joseph, and he says that it was the patriarchs moved by envy, sold Joseph. If the jealousy and the envy had never arisen in their hearts with regard to Joseph, they would never have sold him. He never would have been brought into Egypt. But in the amazing providence of God, his daddy gives him a coat that is a catalyst for creating that envy and jealousy. Their brothers, oh, how little things are included in that wonderful providential dealing of God. And not just the giving of a coat, but the obedience of a son. Because you read there in Genesis 37 about how the brothers are all gone with the herds and the flocks. And then you see Jacob brings Joseph in and says to them, go and look, find your brethren and see how they're doing. And Joseph, as an obedient son, without one quibble, sets out to search for them. And as he goes and he searches, he gets to the place where they're supposed to be. And they're not there. Now, I don't know about you folks, but I know what I was like in my mid-teens. And if my dad had sent me on a journey like this to brothers who maybe didn't like me so well, and if I got to where they were supposed to have been, I would have said, well, they're not there. That's not my fault. It's their fault. And I will be back home again. But Joseph will not leave it at that. As that obedient son to his father, he goes and he searches until he finds his brothers and he's, he's coming searching for them. They see them and they concoct the plan that they're going to do away with them. It's a remarkable thing that he being an obedient son was also included in that providential dealing of God that would lead him down into Egypt. And what about the arrival of the traitors? Because as they have con concocted this scheme and have thrown Joseph into a pit, then they see as they sit down to have their food, the traitors passing by. And it speaks about this and they see the Ishmaelites and they say, let's sell them to the Ishmaelites and we'll get rid of them that way. And so they have to go and they bring them out of the pit, but by that time the Ishmaelites are gone. But remarkably, remarkably, the horizon is not empty, but there they are coming now some Midianite traitor, traitors. Just at that right time. The right time for them to sell Joseph to them, that he might be brought down into Egypt. But not only that, whenever you come on into chapter 39, we see a sad, sad scene, and it's the lust of a woman who looks upon Joseph as he's going about his duties in his house. And this woman is filled with sexual desire, and she wants this young man, and she's determined to have him in her bed. And yet God, in his providential dealings, can even utilize this the sinful lust in the heart of a woman. Amazing, is it not? But did you ever think of this? With regard to this, there's even the features of a youth that God has utilized because it tells us there in that chapter 39 regarding Joseph that it says that he was a goodly person and well-favored. He was a handsome young man. There are some of us men and we could have lived in Potiphar's house without danger. 
because there weren't much to look at. Remember reading about Abraham Lincoln. And on one occasion, a lady said to Abraham Lincoln, Mr. Lincoln, you're the homeliest man I've ever seen. Now, in American ease, that's not a compliment. Homely is really to be ugly. And Lincoln replied to her, Well, ma'am, I cannot help the face that I was born with. The lady replied, Maybe, but you don't have to go out. (laughs) Did you ever think of this? The God who formed Joseph in the womb formed him as an exceptionally handsome young man. And the day would come when that handsomeness would lead to this assault on his morality by this woman who is lusting after him. But God in his providence has been working it all out. And then there is, of course, the integrity of Joseph as a slave. There he is sold down in this land of Egypt. And my, it would be so easy to throw over all the standards that he has in his life. But yet he will not do this. And what integrity Joseph has. And you see it in two levels. And so often one of these levels of integrity is overlooked. Listen to this. She cried to him, lie with me, verse 8. But he refused and said unto his master's wife, Behold, my master knoweth not what is in with me in the house. And he hath committed all that he had to my hand. There is none greater in his house than I. Neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. How then can I do this great wickedness? Listen. Joseph there as a slave recognized how good Potiphar had been to him, how Potiphar had cared for him, and he felt a duty towards Potiphar. And he says, no, I cannot do it because of Potiphar himself. But then he says, how can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Do you notice Joseph's view of adultery? It's not an affair. It's not a fling. It's not a momentary act of pleasure. No, no, it's great wickedness. Great wickedness. My, how far our society has moved from that. But yet God, this is part of his providential dealing. Had Joseph went along with this, there never would have been the shout the cry, the accusation of attempted rape against Joseph to be put into the prison. And then you think of the dreams of prisoners and Pharaoh. And what a marvelous thing that our God is able to come and use the dreams of the night as part of his providential dealings, part of his activity to bring about his will that is good for his people and for the glory of his name. Amazing thing. And is it remarkable to read that in the scriptures? Remember Nebuchadnezzar, how he tells us that he was flourishing in his kingdom and everything was well with him. And then he went to bed one night and he him. And in a moment, all his pieces shattered. He is greatly troubled. My, our God only needs to send a dream. And he has the capacity to do it. On the other hand, remember Ahasuerus there in the book of Esther. And he goes to bed, he closes his eyes, and he just can't get to sleep. Because God so orders it that he will be awake and send for those writings and learn how Mordecai had been utilizing the saving of his life. Oh, what a God we have. He works in the micro, the little things of life, as the world would say it, the insignificant things, but yet he puts together all of these things and he brings it into a wonderful compass at home. I was ill and off work from um, the, the beginning of January until about a fortnight ago, 
And uh, whenever I got back to church in my children's talk, I told the children that um, I'd become uh, qualified, fully qualified as a dissectologist during the time that I'd been off. And I set them the task of Googling it to try to find out what it meant. Dissectologist. Do you know what it is? Somebody who has a passion for doing jigsaw puzzles. Now that's true, that's true. <laughs> this is how I discovered that word. Taking my breakfast one morning, listening to the radio for the National News, and they had the leading dissectologist in England, and the fourth in the world, a lady. God is the greatest dissectologist. He takes all the minutiae of our life, all the little bits and pieces, and he puts them all together for our good and for his glory. Examine your own life and see the little pieces that were brought together in God's purpose to bring you to himself and to bring you to where you are at this point in your life. And listen, dare I say it, even bringing you here to listen to a little man from Northern Ireland whose accent you might struggle to understand, to hear something that may be of good and benefit and blessing to your soul. But he just doesn't work the micro, he works in the macro, the big things of life. Big things of life. Because you see, what is he going to do? He's going to bring this tremendous famine, but prior to that, the seven years of good into Egypt. And when Joseph is called to interpret the dreams for Pharaoh, here is the tremendous statement that he makes to Pharaoh. Verse 25 of chapter 41 of Genesis. And Joseph said unto Pharaoh, the dream of Pharaoh was one. God has showed Pharaoh what he is about to do. <laughs> that little statement. God has showed you what he is about to do. What is he about to do? What is God about to do, Joseph? He's going to bring seven years of immense plenty. And he's going to bring seven years of intense famine. In Psalm 105, it just puts it like this. That God called for a famine. What a wonderful phrase. God just has this famine, come. And the famine comes, grips the land, decimates it. And it's all part of his wonderful purpose. And he's working out through Joseph. In pursuance of his own ends. There's purpose. There's this providence. You see the exercise of his providence. But as we think of the exercise of his promise, this brings to us what we must face, the mystery that there is in his providence. Because here is Joseph there, and God is working out these providential dealings. But for so much of it, Joseph doesn't have a clue what God is doing. And this is one of the difficulties with God's providence. The book of God's providence is one of the most difficult books to read. And usually it can only be read in hindsight. Once you're way in the future, you can look back and see how it's working out. But often the providence of God brings us through dark, difficult, painful valleys and experiences. And so it was for Joseph. I remember whenever Israel or Jacob is pronouncing his blessings upon his family, and he speaks of Joseph. Listen to what he says of Joseph, Genesis 49, 22. Joseph is a fruitful boy, even a fruitful boy by a well, whose branches ran over the wall. The archers have sorely grieved him and shot at him and hated him. And he recognized himself what Joseph had had to endure. And the suffering that Joseph had to go through was so, so intense. And again there in that book of Psalms, in Psalm 105 that I've already referenced, it tells us about Joseph and how his brothers took him. And it says this, verse 17, Psalm 105. 
He that is the Lord sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold for a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron. And there Joseph suffered so much at the hand of his brothers. And then he suffered so intensely for such a long period of time. And that suffering at times was physical. His feet they hurt with fetters. He was taken and bound like a captive and carried away in pain. And surely there must have been intense mental struggles for him to be snatched away to have his brothers treat him in such a fashion. And not only that, but then to do so much in Pharaoh's house and then to be accused of attempted rape and put into prison with that awful stigma on his character. A man who was just wanting to live a life of purity. And there's deep, deep emotional aspects to that suffering. And surely spiritual as well. Whenever we read there in that book of Psalms, it says, until the time as, uh, uh, whose feet they hurt with fetters, and he was led in iron. His feet was led in iron. I know that uh, ESV, NIV, and so on, they have something along the lines that there was an iron collar put around his neck. But Calvin, for instance, he, he translates this that, that the iron came into his soul. There's one where the iron pierced his soul and is conveying the depth of the suffering that he had to endure. Listen, brethren and sisters, contrary to the health, wealth, and prosperity preachers, there are times whenever the Lord leads us through very, very dark, mysterious, difficult valleys. And it is so hard to understand what he is doing. So hard to fathom it. And what a mystery it was when his own son came into this world. And for onlookers to view him and see how he was stigmatized, how he was criticized, how he was hated. And all that he would endure as he would stand and I would begin to speak and say, Now is my soul troubled. And what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? When he endures that soul trouble as he contemplates Calvary and as he goes there into the Garden of Gethsemane and he sweats, as it were, great drops of blood. And the suffering is so intense in his humanity that there is sent an angel from heaven to strengthen him. Imagine the Son of God in his humanity reaching a stage where he needs an angel from heaven to strengthen him in it. We can't begin to imagine the depths of his suffering. But it was all for our good and for the glory of God. And so it is. And if there's somebody here this morning and you came out of your house having spent the night tossing and turning, maybe weeping because of circumstances that you're going through in your life and you simply cannot interpret them, you cannot understand them. Know that you have a good God, a wise God, God who loves you so much he gave his son to go through those horrors of Calvary for you. And he will never be mistaken and he will work out his purpose for good and his glory in your life. I wasn't given a time, by the way, when I was to finish, so I have another couple of things to say. Not take long. First of all, you see the purpose that there is. You see the providence. And here's the provision. Because in the midst of all that Joseph was going through, so much of it which he could not understand or interpret, Yet God made a provision for him, a dual provision for him, of wonderful graces that must have sustained him so, so wonderfully in some of his difficult times. And in, in, in chapter 41 of Genesis again, we read this, verse 51. Uh, sorry, verse 50. 
And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Ishanath, the daughter of Potiphar, a priest of On, bare unto him. And I listened carefully. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for God said, He hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim, for God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. And he gave his sons those two names for this specific reason. The meaning of names is so important in the word of God. Let me tell you this. Our son is the pastor here. My wife and I, Christine, named them Jonathan, James, Maguire, and Dowds. I'll not tell you what that mouthful is for. But the Jonathan part is very precious to us. But my wife and I are the only people on earth who call him Jonathan. Everybody else calls him Johnny. But Jonathan is gift of God. He's a gift that God gave to us. Now Joseph names his sons for a reason. He said, Manasseh. He's called Manasseh because God has made me forget all my toil. That is all of my difficulty, all of my anguish, all of my hardships. He's for made me forget all of those things in all my father's house. Now, whenever he says he's forgotten his father's house, that's not an absolute thing. Because whenever the brothers will eventually come, he recognizes them all and he'll be able to set them in order at the table so that they all have exactly in order the places set out for them according to their age. He hasn't forgotten everything, but what it is, he has forgotten the toil, the anguish, the sorrows, the bitternesses of it. And it's not that they're eating them up and seeking for revenge, but God in grace has made him forgetful of those things. This is a godlike characteristic because what is it that the word of God says in the terms of the new covenant to us? Your sins and your iniquities I will what? Remember no more. Now I want you to notice he doesn't say I will forget. I don't believe God can forget because God is a, uh, it's a sign of weakness to forget. But the concept is that those things, I will never, ever hold them against you ever again. That's what God is saying there. I think this is what is going on with Joseph. And this is such a precious thing, brethren and sisters. We have a God who, as he brings us through uh, these things in our lives, working on his purpose, and we encounter so many things, but he is able to cultivate in us this grace whereby those things that have been so hurtful to us, that so many have brought into our lives and hurt us by, that he can enable us to deal with those things and no longer hold them, no longer have bitterness, no longer have resentment. And there's none but he can do such a thing. And Joseph says he has made me forgetful in this sense. But then Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. He has been fruitful. And it's a wonderful whenever our God is able to come and work. And in the midst of affliction, and his wonderful providence, use those circumstances as a means of producing the fruit that he wants to see in our lives. Remember Jesus said, John 15, here is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. And he wants to see more and more fruit in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit and so on. The love and gentleness, goodness, meekness, faith, etc. And so often he brings us through these times of affliction and he makes them of a means of making us fruitful. Psalm 119, the psalmist said, it is good for me that I have been afflicted. And so often that is the way God deals. Brings us through these things and in the midst of the affliction he makes us fruitful. Let me share a personal little anecdote. I shared it with my own congregation the other Lord's Day. But um, on one occasion I was saying to my wife Christine as we were chatting in bed one night and I said to her that um, as we were talking about spiritual things I said uh, praying through the the fruit of the Spirit, love, 
joy, peace, gentleness, goodness, and a week for each one praying that the Lord would come and help to cultivate these things in my life. And we talked about that, and then a few weeks, days later, um, again, we were sharing, and there was this lady who was causing me great angst, <laughs> great difficulty, <laughs> really, really was, and I began to unburden myself with Christine about it. And Christine, being my wonderful counsellor, said to me, well, what did you expect? <laughs> well, what do you mean? She said, if you're going to pray for the Lord to produce long-suffering, patience in your life, how are you going to know it unless you have to deal with people that are trying you in those areas? Brethren and sisters, God has a purpose. He's going to make us like Jesus who exhibited the fruit of the Spirit to the greatest degree. And God will bring us through these things that he might produce. That freedom make us more and more like Jesus. The last word. All right, you've got pur present and purpose, providence. You've also had provision. And then there's presence. Because, you see, Joseph, as he was there in Egypt, my he knew the presence of the Lord and how wonderful the Lord was to him. Back in Acts chapter 7, I've already cited this, but we read in verse 9 as Stephen is speaking, he says this, And the patriarchs moved with envy, sold Joseph into Egypt, but God was with him. And then whenever you come into Genesis 39 there, you read about Joseph being in Potiphar's house and it tells us that God was with him. It even tells us that Potiphar could see that God was with him. And then whenever he is there in the prison, again we read, God was with him. And oh, is it not the case that no matter where we are, so long as God is with us, that is the best place for us to be. Far rather in a prison or a pit with the Lord than be in any palace without him. But to know the reality of that wonderful promise that the Saviour has given, that as we go out in fulfilment of his will to serve him, he says, I will be with you always, even to the very end. That wonderful, wonderful promise, I will never leave you, nor forsake you. Oh, thank God, when we know he is with us. There is nothing in all this world more precious. As I was growing up, we had a pastor in the church in Lisburn that I grew up in called Gordon Cardwell. He was a Scot. Can't say anything about the Scottish folk because my wife's a Scot. But I remember Gordon Cardwell saying about how whenever he came over to Ireland at first and he spent a couple of years in another church rather than Lisburn and there he had quite a difficult time. But he was with an older pastor on one occasion. And Gordon was driving. The older pastor was questioning him, how are you getting on, Gordon? How are things going for you? And Gordon began to unburden himself about the difficulties and so on. He was a man at this time, about 32 years of age, Gordon. And this old pastor said to him, Gordon, is the Lord with you? And Gordon said, well, I believe he is. And the older man just reached over and squeezed his knee and said, then that's enough. Folks, if God is with you, that's enough. And Christ hath once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And that doesn't mean just at the end of the earthly journey. That's every day that you live. Did you pray this morning? Really pray. Then according to Ephesians, Christ is the one through whom you came, aided by the Holy Spirit, 
right into the presence of God and you spoke with him. Can there be a greater privilege in this life? Now to know that he is with us. It's incomparable, indescribable. So, (laughs) the message of hope in the life of Joseph. I hope these four words that we've considered will help you to contemplate that and will be of help to you as you mull over these things in the days ahead. And I'm not sure, are you going to give out to him? Have I to give out to him? Or I give out to him? Have I to close in prayer then? Or Okay, right. Let's turn to the little sheet that we have. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. I don't talk about uh, experiences much, but I remember a number of years ago with one of the members of our family, where we were, not Johnny, <laughs> we were having difficulties, heartaches, and I wakened up in the middle of one night as I wakened up, these words immediately were running through my head. Ye fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds ye so much dread are big with mercy and shall break with blessings on your head. And that's one of the verses of this wonderful hymn. God moves in a mysterious way. Well, let's stand together and let's sing. <clears throat> Our gracious God, our loving Heavenly Father, we bow humbly and reverently in your presence this day. We thank you for your wonderful word that is so precious to us. And we thank you, our God, for the measure of the aid of the Spirit that we have known in our gathering thus far. And we thank you for the lessons that we learn from the life of Joseph the glorious message of hope that is portrayed therein for us. And oh, we thank you that you had such a wonderful purpose in Joseph's life. And in your providence you worked 
to bring that purpose to fruition. And though that providence was so mysterious at times and painful, yet you were never mistaken. And we thank you that you did provide for Joseph in the midst of the outworking of that providence. And thank you that he did know your presence, even in the prison, even in the pit, even in the worst, you were with them. And oh, we thank you for the great promises that are made over to us. We thank you that we know that you're working out a purpose in our lives. You're conforming us, those of us who know you, to the image of your Son. And oh, we thank you that that will bring such glory to you. And that is the greatest desire in our hearts. That you would be exalted, that you, our God, would be made glorious. And all oh, be pleased to use us to that end. And our Father, help us to know that ill that you bless is our good. And on blessed good is ill. And all is best that seems most wrong, if it be your sweet will. Thank you for that will that was worked out at Calvary. And thank you, our God, for that wonderful purpose that was fulfilled there. And thank you that we are beneficiaries of that. And may we ever praise your name and exalt our glorious Saviour for all that has been wrought on our behalf. We give you thanks for it all. Now continue with us in this day and bless, bless this time greatly to us, everyone, we ask it. In Jesus' precious and wonderful name. Amen and amen. Well, we are due to meet back at quarter past. Uh, I see we have our speaker for the afternoon. And therefore, um, know that we can enjoy our lunch uh, in peace. So if you need to be reminded of where to go, do please speak to young Pastor Dowds, or indeed to Sarah or George, uh, and uh, uh, we'll see you back with your sandwiches or after them. And uh, trust that we shall have as blessed an afternoon as we have had a morning. Thank you.